Have you ever felt like something's missing? Maybe you go to eat a hamburger and you're like, this was a good hamburger, but it wasn't a great hamburger. Some, something was, was missing with this. Or you order a burrito and you have this burrito and you're like, mm, man, it's just not quite right. Something is missing. Or a cup of coffee. There's probably nothing more irritating than just a cup of coffee being a little bit off. Something is missing with this cup of coffee. I think we feel it relationally sometimes where we're like, man, something's just off. It's not quite right. There, there's something missing in this uh, relationship where Paul comes to this group of believers in Ephesus and the Bible calls them disciples and believers. And he's like, there's something missing. What caused Paul to ask this question? Hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What was it that caused Paul to discern this? Was it their lack of patience? Was it their lack of joy, their lack of, of love? And, and sometimes I think also we would admit in our relationship with God, something just seems to be a little bit missing. We go, man, I really can't have victory over sin. I'm really struggling to be with a light the way that I would desire. There, there is a, a lack of joy. There is a, a lack of peace. And, and for this 12, these 12 men, what was missing was their understanding of the Holy Spirit. And there's this discussion of, well, were they believers but hadn't been baptized with the Spirit? Or were they not believers? And then they received Christ as their Savior. But it appears that they did understand salvation. They believed in Christ, that they were believers. But they didn't have any understanding of the role of the Holy Spirit or being empowered by the Spirit of God. Either way, there was definitely something missing with the understanding of the Spirit. So tonight, I want to dive deep on, well, what's the need of the Holy Spirit? What's the role of the Holy Spirit? How are we empowered with the, the Spirit of God? But the Christian life is not like bowling. Let me explain. I hate bowling. Somebody said I love bowling. Uh, yeah, uh, it is the worst game ever. Let me tell you why. Because my mom is a bowler, my brother's a bowler, and we would have these family bowling nights, and let's all go bond together as a family. And I'd get spanked by my mom. It's like, this is not fun. Like, I, I cannot handle losing to my mom. And then my mom's not competitive, and so she'll start losing just to make you feel better about yourself, which actually makes you feel worse about yourself. Like mom had to throw the game in order for, for me to win. So I just find bowling to be really frustrating. I mean, you're, you're trying to get these strikes and you're try harder and try harder and then it just goes worse and worse. And sometimes I think that's what we feel with the Christian life, don't we? It's like, man, I should be a better Christian. I should be having more victory. I should be having self-control. And a lot of times we're trying to live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. When you really examine what God calls us to in the scriptures, there is no way we can live it out in our own strength. It's completely impossible. We have to understand the Holy Spirit. We've got to rely upon the Spirit of God. So we're going to start in Zechariah chapter 4. And then we're going to work our way to John's gospel John chapter 14, but this is Zechariah chapter 4. The period of history for Zechariah, Zerubbabel, is they are returning from captivity. There were 70 years where Judah goes into captivity, southern Israel, to the Babylonians. God punished them for their idolatry, and God says, I'm going to bring you back into the land. God fulfills that promise, opens the door, and they then rebuild the temple. And they're right in the middle of this building project. And Zerubbabel specifically, this word is spoken to Zerubbabel. He's getting discouraged. They've laid the foundation of the temple. They're in the season of small things where there seems to be no breakthrough. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And God gives this word for Zerubbabel to be encouraged that it's not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So verse 1 of Zechariah 4. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who's wakened out of his sleep. So the angel wakes up Zechariah and he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. 
And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. And so he's seeing this lamp stand with, with seven pipes to the lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at the left. So this continual flow of oil going from the olive trees to the lamp stand. So if you can kind of picture that in your mind, that's what Zechariah is seeing. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what are these things, my Lord? The angel who talked with me answered and said, do you not know what these are? And he said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Zerubbabel in rebuilding the temple, it's not going to be by his might. It's not going to be by his power, but it's going to be by the spirit of the Lord. The oil that's going into the lamp is a picture of the Holy Spirit. To be a light, that's the Christian life, that we could be a light into the darkness. We have to have power from the Lord. And I want to suggest to you tonight that in order for us to experience the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we have to get to a place where we understand it's not by might and it's not by power. Because if we're honest, we kind of want it to be by our might and by our power. We want to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We want to work harder. We want to do better. We want to be able to say, I took my Christian life seriously. I, I really put in the effort. I, I read my Bible. I went to church on Wednesday night. And I was the one that contributed to the results. But God wants the glory. When we read in the book of Acts, can we say that this movement of God is by power and by might? Is it man's strategies? Is it man's good ideas? Is it man's abilities? No, it, it's not. It's not that the church was so gifted and so talented and had so much money. It, it's not by mind. It's, it's not by power. How many times in scripture does God work when man is humbled? When people are at a place where we're overwhelmed, we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. It's not by might, it's not by power. He uses the weak and the foolish to confound the wise. So, so we have to get to a place where we're humbled and we realize, okay, this Christian life is not going to be my might, my power, what I bring to the table, but it's going to be by the Spirit of the Lord. Realizing I need God's help, needing God's wisdom, needing his empowerment. That's the word to Zerubbabel. For you to be able to build this temple, it's going to be by the Spirit of the Lord. In verse 7 who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. A huge mountain, a huge obstacle in front of Zerubbabel when it comes to this building project. And what's going to happen of this mountain? It's going to be made a plain. It's going to go from Pikes Peak to Lyman, right? These, these huge mountains to this plain that extends out into Kansas and beyond, where you can watch your dog run away for three days, right? <laughs> Do you feel like there's, there's a mountain in front of you? You've got a mountain in front of you and your family. You've got a mountain with your, your finances, your health, work situation. It's just this huge mountain that, that's weighing over you. I, I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this or over this. And God says, I'm going to do it. And when it is leveled to the point where it's a plane, the capstone or the memorial is going to be a shout of grace, grace to it. When this temple is rebuilt, there's going to be this testimony that it was God's grace. It was going to be this testimony of the Lord did it. And isn't that what we want from our lives? And isn't that what God wants from our lives where we humble ourselves, God gets the glory, and everyone clearly sees this was God's grace. It wasn't that Zerubbabel was a great leader. He was willing. But it was the Lord. The Lord did this. The Lord rebuilt the temple. The Lord took this mountain and made it a plain. And the capstone is grace, grace. A lot of us would love the epitaph at our funeral to be all of our accomplishments. Well, wouldn't it be a cool testimony at our funeral if they shouted, grace, grace. This was a knucklehead sinner that God saved by grace. This is the Lord. And that's, that's what the Lord desires to, to take place. 
Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. So Zerubbabel must be questioning, hey, I started this, but I don't think I'm going to finish it. The obstacle is so great, he thinks that he's going to be out of the equation. He's not going to be able to see it to its completion. And the encouragement comes to Zerubbabel and says, no, you laid this foundation, which is the hard part. The hardest part is the foundation. His hands are also going to finish it. Zerubbabel, you're going to see it to the end. And that may be God's encouragement to you tonight. You might be in the middle of something really hard. And God's saying, I want to meet you with my spirit. I want to empower you with my spirit. It's not your power. It's not your might. It's by my spirit. I'm going to do a victory. Keep at it. You're going to finish the work that that you started. Then you will know, continuing in verse 9, that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Then you're going to know that this was a word from the Lord. For who has despised the day of small things? I think we can all raise our hands, right? This is a question. Who who's despised the day of small things? Yeah, me, right? It's hard to be faithful. It's hard to be Zerubbabel and just continue to build the temple stone after stone. We know from the book of Hosea that God's people got distracted and they were more will- worried about building their own houses instead of the temple of the Lord. He's, he's having a hard time motivating God's people to want to invest in worship and invest in the, in the temple. And, and God's saying, hey, don't despise the day of small things. It's adding up. This temple is getting built one stone at a time, one brick at a time. For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. God sees. Zerubbabel, God sees. God sees your faithfulness. God sees Zerubbabel's faithfulness. God sees your faithfulness. Others may not see your faithfulness. Others may not appreciate your faithfulness. God sees. Be faithful in the little things. You'll be faithful with much. Rely upon the Spirit of God. So I wonder what it was like for Zerubbabel because apparently he didn't give up. Apparently he saw the fulfillment of this promise. He saw the temple built. He learned what it was like to rely upon the Holy Spirit. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So that's the need for the Holy Spirit. And then let's look at the role of the Holy Spirit in John 14. John chapter 14, verse 15. Where are we at in scripture with John 14 is that this is Christ's time with the disciples right before he's crucified. These are the things that are really near and dear to to Jesus' heart. The disciples are confused about what's going to happen. They've got a troubled heart. Jesus is saying, don't let your heart be troubled because I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. So they're hearing that Jesus is going to leave them, but they don't grasp the crucifixion. They don't grasp the resurrection. And in Jesus announcing that he's going to depart, he also tells the promise of the Spirit in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands, and I pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. This is speaking of the Holy Spirit. He says, the Father, he's going to give you another. And the idea there is one that is similar to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're distinct persons, but yet one God and going to give another, another helper is going to be granted to you. And then this is spoken and says that he may abide with you forever. Let's go back up just a little bit to verse 12 as well. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And then this promise in verse 15 and 16 that he's not going to leave them alone, but he's going to send them a helper, and the helper is going to abide with them forever. In the Greek, this word helper, it means paraclete. That's the Greek word. And it actually means to come alongside and help. And this is the role of the Holy Spirit. When we 
think about the Holy Spirit. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and helps. And these are amazing words that Jesus speaks, that the disciples are going to do greater works than Christ. How, how is that even possible, that the disciples could do greater works than Christ? The only answer is the Holy Spirit. The only answer is, is the helper will come alongside and we do see this transformation happening in the lives of the disciples, especially Peter, as the Holy Spirit came upon them, as the Holy Spirit was coming alongside of them to help. Can you think of some different times in your life where someone very practically came alongside to help you and the value that that was? You're like, man, without their help, I literally would have not learned this. I would have not gotten through this. It was 2019, I decided I wanted to run my first half marathon because I turned 40 years old. I think by the time I got around to it, I was like 41. But I was like, okay, I'm trying to fight off this reality that I'm old, right? So I signed up for the half marathon and did some training, probably not quite enough training. And I thought in my mind, I can do this without drinking any water or doing any fueling. It's like, it can't be that bad. It was like, my goal was a, a two-hour marathon and it was Labor Day weekend and I'm all set and gung-ho and, and ready to go. So I'm running and then about mile 10, I get this huge cramp in my hamstring. Like, I was just like, oh my goodness, like what, what in the world's happened? And there was this guy that I was kind of running with throughout the race and he'd be out in front of me and then I'd be out in front of him and and he comes up literally alongside of me and he goes, dude, you need to take one of these. And he handed me a gel pack. And then he's like, have you been drinking any water? I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, take the gel pack and then there's a station and just get yourself hydrated. Like you're, you're dehydrated. And he literally came alongside and helped. And then with the gel pack and some water, the cramp, released enough where I could finish the race. And we actually finished the race together. Like we finished those last three, three miles together. And that the coolest thing was at the end of the race, I see him talking to this young couple that at the time were engaged. And, I, and I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's Hannah and Steven. And I'm watching a little bit closer. And this guy that helped me was Hannah's dad. And I never even met him. Like he was a complete stranger. I was a complete stranger. He was just helping a stranger. But I'll never forget that. Like, I don't think I would have finished the half marathon if it wasn't for his help, his experiencing, knowing better. And that's the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit knows stuff we don't know, obviously, right? And so the Holy Spirit wants to come alongside of us in every area of life and give us help in marriage, in work, in understanding the scripture, in being a witness. We, we oftentimes think, I, I gotta do this on my own when we have the help of the Holy Spirit who's with us forever, the helper. It goes on in verse 13, or excuse me, verse 17, describing the spirit, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The spirit of truth. Jesus says the helper is going to lead us in truth. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. The relationship with the spirit is the spirit's with you, but then the spirit shall be in you. And this is something that the new covenant provides. In the Old Testament, we don't see the spirit of God living inside of people. The spirit of God's with them, but when Jesus died and rose again, then he breathed on the disciples and the Holy Spirit was, was in them. The moment you receive Christ your Savior, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. So the relationship with God goes from external to internal, and that's really cool. God's Spirit lives inside of us. God's Spirit knows us better than we know ourselves. And God now is writing his will and his word, his law upon our hearts where the Old Testament was exterior. Now, now the Holy Spirit is, is putting inside of us the heart for God and the heart to, to live out our faith. The Holy Spirit will be in you. And you're not orphans. You're not left alone. You're gonna have the, the Holy Spirit. 
Let's jump down to verse 25 where Jesus explains the spirit a little bit more. These things I've spoken to you while you were present. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. What's the role of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is our helper, but also our teacher. And this is really important, is you also have the best teacher living inside of you. We, we oftentimes feel, I can't understand the Bible, but the Spirit of God lives inside of us as believers. It's so important when you read the scripture is to invite the Holy Spirit to teach you, to instruct you. The Holy Spirit wants us to understand the word, wants us to understand Jesus, and he's going to lead us and guide us in truth. This is who he is. He, he is the teacher of truth. He's going to expound, and then he's also going to bring things to our remembrance. Have you ever had the Holy Spirit do that? Maybe it's a really difficult time, and all of a sudden, you start remembering verses that you didn't even know that you put in your heart. You don't even remember but the Holy Spirit is bringing it back to your remembrance. And that's why it's so important to spend time in God's word and spend time in church because you're pouring truth into your heart and your life and the Spirit can bring it back to, to remembrance. And that's awesome. And that's part of the help of, of the Holy Spirit. So he's the teacher. He's bringing things back in remembrance. And then peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It feels like to the disciples, they have a lot to be worried about, that they wouldn't have peace. Jesus is dying upon the cross, but Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you, but I'm also not going to leave you alone. You're not going to be an orphan. You're going to have the Holy Spirit with you, and the Holy Spirit is going to provide peace. And it's the peace of Jesus. That's really cool. That's really radical. Christ's peace given to us. Jesus went through suffering, but he had peace. For us to be able to experience the peace that Jesus had, and it's not the peace that the world gives. The world doesn't provide security. The world cannot provide rest. The world cannot provide forgiveness of sin, right? It's not what the world provides. I mean, the world's really confused right now with it being an election year, with everything that's going on in the economy, you look to this world, you're not going to have peace. But you look to the Holy Spirit, he gives us the peace of Jesus. It's not as the world gives. In verse 29, and now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father and the Father gave me commandment, so I do arise, let us go from here. He's describing to him the crucifixion. Now let's jump to chapter 16 and look some more at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. This is chapter 16, verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus is saying, if I don't go to the Father, then the Father is not going to send the Spirit. And it's actually to your advantage that I go away so that the helper can come. So this is how Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit, the helper, the helper, the one who comes alongside and helps. Now, let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples. They have the amazing privilege, treat of walking with Jesus, being in the presence of Jesus day and night, and Jesus says, okay, I'm out of here, guys, and it's actually going to be better for you because I'm going to send the helper, and the helper is going to be in you. And this speaks of the amazing, amazing gift that the Holy Spirit is in our lives because in Jesus's physical body, he was not inside the heart of the disciples, but the Holy Spirit is in them. The Holy Spirit lives inside of them, and it's even a deeper relationship than Jesus standing right next to them. It's incredible. 
it, it's hard for us. I think m- most of us, if we said, you know what, we can have it the way that it is with being the temple of the Holy Spirit, or we can have Jesus over for dessert tonight. We, I, I'm having Jesus over for dessert. Like, how cool would that be, physical, bodily Jesus, to come over to my house and, and hang out, and then maybe he could just stay, right? But Jesus is saying, no, that, that's an external relationship. It's even better for you to have the helper living inside of you. In Jesus's physical body, him choosing limitations, he can be in one place at one time. For us to be able to have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, the Spirit's always with us with every believer. Whether it's Afghanistan or South America or Russia or here in Colorado, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In verse 8, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and see you no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. This is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit as he convicts of sin. He convicts us of sin before we come to know Christ as our Savior. He continues to convict us of sin as believers. And isn't it powerful when the Holy Spirit does that and we're listening? I mean, I grew up in a Christian family. I grew up going to Christian school. And I didn't have a lot of conviction over my sin. I wasn't listening. And when I got in high school and there was this emptiness in my life, God was gracious to convict me of my sin. God was gracious to show me how hard my heart was towards Christ and how much I needed the blood of Jesus upon the cross. That, that was the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And there's times as a believer where we think everything's fine and the Holy Spirit's like, no, it's not fine. And he calls us on it and he brings it to light. It's like, no, you've got to deal with that. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Spirit working in our lives. And it's a good thing and it's, it's a beautiful thing. In verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, so again, the spirit's described as the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the job of the Holy Spirit is to help, is to teach, is to convict, and we see specifically what the Spirit's all about. The Spirit is about truth, is going to lead us and guide us in truth. So how do you know the Spirit of God's working in your life? How do you know the Spirit of God's working in in a church? It's not necessarily emotionalism. There might be a lot of emotion that's happening, but when God is taking us deeper into his word, because that's what the spirit does. He leads us and guides us into truth. If there's a move of the spirit and there's not a move into God's word, it's probably not a move of the spirit. You know what I'm saying? So God's spirit is going to lead us into God's word because that's who the spirit is. And then did you notice that it says he will glorify me? So when there's a move of the Spirit, Jesus is going to be glorified. People are going to have a greater understanding of who who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit doesn't want any attention. It's not about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to take us deeper into truth, which is going to take us deeper into Jesus. The Spirit's all about glorifying the Son. So that's when we know the Spirit of God is moving in our lives. And when we study the Scripture, it makes us more comfortable with the Holy Spirit. When we understand the role of the Holy Spirit, we go, man, I need help. I need conviction. I I need to be taught. And I understand the Spirit's not going to lead me to some kind of weirdness. The Spirit's going to lead me deeper into the truth, and Christ is going to be glorified. Now, remember this weekend in Acts chapter 19, the title of the message was Gospel Riot. It's like, start a riot. Like, let's see Jesus shake the very core of a city and get the attention of of a city. Well, how does that happen? Only a move of the Spirit. When the Spirit's moving, Christ is glorified. So a community sees more of who who Jesus is. 
You may be wondering, well, man, is the Spirit of God moving in my life? Do you love Jesus? Are you thankful for the gospel? Do you want to point people to Jesus? Man, that means the Spirit of God is alive and well in your life. Again, to try to think of this as an illustration, the guidance of the Spirit to me is like a really good GPS system, right? You type in the directions. The difference is God types in the directions, you know, through his word. He's like, this, this is it. This is my message. This is my heart. This is my direction for your life. And when you've got it dialed in on your phone, then what's your phone doing? In 450 feet, take a right on Dublin Boulevard. You're like, shut up, right? Like I, you get a little tired of hearing it, but it gives you all this guidance. And then you get off track, uh, do a U-turn, you reroute, reroute. It's like, oh man, you know? But the thing with the Holy Spirit, it's the infallible GPS system. Because sometimes the GPS is wrong on our phones. And then Waze is kind of a cool app if you use that. It predicts traffic and tells you the best, best route. And then people can get on there and chime in what they're experiencing. I don't know how that really works. Are they driving and texting on the app at the same time? Like, doesn't seem to be a good idea, but... There's all this wealth of information of saying, hey, there's this obstacle coming and, and that's the spirit of God alive in the word of God. So, so we're studying God's word, but we're reading it and we're relying upon the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's bringing to light, hey, Eric, this is what you need to know. When we go to spend time with God in his word, we're reading it saying, Holy Spirit, what in this passage is for me? We're listening to a message. What in this passage is for me? And God begins to speak and he gives encouragement and he gives direction and he gives challenge and it, it comes right from the word of God, but the spirit is, is putting it. Have you ever had that where you're reading the scripture and then all of a sudden you're like, man, that verse, that truth, that, that's, that's exactly what I needed. <laughs> you know, I was reading in my devotions today in the book of Exodus and honestly, it was a little bit of a boring passage with all of the details of them building the tabernacle. But at the very end, it said, basically when the cloud moved, they moved. And when the cloud parked, they parked. And that's what I needed. I needed to hear that this morning because there's a couple of different areas and you can ask my wife, like, like I'm pushing. I'm like, I'm, I'm ready for the cloud to move. Like, come on, let's, let's do this. Can we force the cloud to move? Like, I'm tired of being parked here. And the Lord's like, no, my provision hasn't moved forward. God led the children of Israel in the wilderness with a cloud. They would walk by the shade and, and to say, okay, Lord, well, what are you doing? Because your provision hasn't moved. So do I need to stay and wait and wait for your hand? But that was God trying to speak to me through uh, the Holy Spirit. And, and after reading that, I went to Amherst, like, I need to back off. This situation, I need to back off. I, I know that I'm trying to force this and it's not necessarily the Lord, but but that's the spirit of truth. That, that's the GPS of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. Well, let's look at a few more verses. Let's look at John chapter 20, where the Holy Spirit comes in the disciples. And then we'll look at Acts chapter one. Christ rises from the dead. The disciples are locked in a room and Jesus breaks in. John 20 verse 19 then the same day at evening being shut, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he'd said this thing, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Notice Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Christ risen from the dead. This is Jesus fulfilling his word that the spirit of God is in them. But then we see in the book of Acts, and this is a little bit of review for us, but it's been a while, Acts chapter one, verse four, it's the empowering of this Holy Spirit. So the need for the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit, and then the empowering of, of the Holy Spirit. So Acts one, verse four. But let's pause for just a second. 
Jesus dies, rises again, breathes on the disciples, the Holy Spirit's in them. Jesus says, I'm going to go and I'm going to return to my Father. I don't want you guys to do anything until you receive the power of the Spirit, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I just, I just want you to wait. Just wait. And you'll know. It's kind of like the whole thing when you're single and you're young and you're asking older couples, how do you know it's the one? What do they say? Oh, you'll know. You'll just know. It's the worst answer ever when you're a young single person. You're like, that didn't help me out at all, right? Jesus is just looking at the disciples. How do we know when the Spirit's empowered us? Well, you'll know. You're, you're, you're going to know when, when the Spirit has empowered you. But Jesus didn't want the disciples going out and doing his work without the filling of the Holy Spirit. So you need to wait. You need to wait until I empower you. It, it was that important. So this is Acts 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them to depart. They commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. This is everything Jesus was speaking about in John 14 through 16, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And this ties in with Acts 19, where they had experienced the baptism of John the Baptist, but not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To be immersed, completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? The disciples always have Israel in mind. They're like, well, this must mean that we get to kick out the Romans finally, and Israel's going to be restored. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and you shall receive power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's this third relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with you, and the Holy Spirit's in you, and the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And for some reason, for us as believers, this is what we're most nervous about, is the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where believers disagree. And some go, well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for today. This is something just for the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit's in you the moment that you get saved, but there isn't this third relationship with, with the Holy Spirit. I'm really not too concerned with what you call it, but I am concerned with all of us understanding that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need it. We absolutely need the filling of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what God has called us to do, to be witnesses. Now, now notice what Jesus says here. He doesn't say, and you shall go witnessing. And that's great. And I think that we need to do that more, to go and, and share our faith. But he says, so you shall be witnesses, so that people could look at their life and they could see a testimony of Jesus Christ with their words proclaiming the gospel, but also in their actions. How could somebody look at my life and see Jesus if it's not for the power of the Holy Spirit? Where the world looks on and goes, man, there's something different about those Christians because they have the power of the Holy Spirit. So you shall be witnesses. You shall be the light of the world. This is, this is who you are as an example of Jesus Christ. We've got to be able to have the power of God, the power of, of the Holy Spirit to be able to be witnesses. And then Jesus paints this big picture. Witnesses in Jerusalem, which is where they're at, Judea, which is the surrounding region, Samaria, which is a little bit further north, and then to the ends of the earth. God wants to send these disciples out throughout the world to be witnesses of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. That ends up being the outline for the book of Acts. But something was different about these disciples in Ephesus where Peter rolls up, or excuse me, Paul rolls up and he's like, hey, 
have you guys received the Holy Spirit when you believed? Has anybody taught you about the Holy Spirit? Are you experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus said he's going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit, that you're going to have power that's going to come on your life. And then notice how simple it is. Paul explains the Holy Spirit, and then he says, let me pray for you. And he lays hands on these 12 guys, and he prays for them, and they start to speak in tongues, and they start to prophesy. And it says there in Acts 19, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And I don't think we want to overcomplicate it is for us to say, Lord, you desire for me to be empowered with the Holy Spirit, so Lord, I say yes. And I'm realizing it's not by power, not by might. I'm emptying myself. And God, would you fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit? And we do see several times in the book of Acts of allowing someone to pray for you for that filling of the Holy Spirit. And we're gonna do that tonight as we enter into worship. If you're like, you know what? I don't know that I've ever experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if anybody's ever taught me before that I need to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And you come and allow someone on the prayer team to put their hand on your, your shoulder, to lay hands on you and pray that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you may speak in tongues. I believe tongues is for today. Or you may prophesy. Or you may go back to your seat and go, nothing in the world happened, right? <laughs> That's not the point. It's not the point that you'd speak in tongues. It's not the point that you'd prophesy. The point is, is that we would be witnesses and to then respond in faith and say, God wants me to rely upon the Holy Spirit. I'm praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm trusting that God is gonna give me that because it lines up with his will. And I'm gonna go spend some time in the word and I'm gonna ask that the helper is gonna help me. I'm going to ask that he's going to guide me in truth. I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to lead me in my relationships and family, lead me at work, lead me with my neighbors. I'm just going to trust what the word of God says, that God wants me to be relying upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this. He said, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids. It's fun to give gifts to your kids. It's fun to bless them. How much more does your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So yes, the Holy Spirit's in us, but for some reason, God wants us to be asking for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think it's that humility piece. And you may have heard me talk about this before, but also in Ephesians, we mentioned it over the weekend, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's this continual command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're daily going to the Lord. Lord, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? I'm surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm surrendering to his help. I'm surrendering to you, Holy Spirit, being my teacher. And then letting the Spirit of God help us, letting the Spirit of God guide us, allowing the Holy Spirit to stir us to take steps of faith. I mean, that's what we see in the book of Acts is the Spirit of God is leading these believers to do things that they wouldn't have done on their own. It's the spirit of the Lord that's, that's moving them and guiding them and directing them to then take those, those steps of faith. Yeah, a really monumental time for me in the understanding of the, the spirit was a guy in our church and his name was Clancy. And he was dying of cancer and he knew that he was dying of cancer. And he wasn't fighting it. When you spent time with him, it wasn't that he was like, oh man, this is the worst ever. He was at peace with going home to be with the Lord, but he also wanted time to be with his family. He was a grandpa. Wanted as much time that he could be with his wife, with his kids, with his grandkids. So he was doing the cancer treatments to get a little bit more time. And the cancer treatments were not curative. There was no way that he was going to be cured of his cancer. And they were extremely painful. And I had the opportunity to sit with him a a couple of times when he was waiting for his his cancer treatments. And in one of those times we were sitting and he said, you know, Eric, this has been so hard. I found myself every day crying out to the Holy Spirit, saying, Holy Spirit, you know me better than I know myself. And would you help me through this? Would you show me how 
to be able to get through this. And he began to express how the Holy Spirit began to help him and how the Holy Spirit began to guide him. And I was like, wow, what a beautiful prayer to be able to go, man, Holy Spirit, you live inside of me. You know me better than I know myself. You know the joys, you know the struggles, you know the, everything in between. And would you, would you help me? Would you walk me, me through this? Wouldn't it be amazing if God began to work in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit where there started to be some victory over sin? Where the Holy Spirit began to speak to our lives and just said, hey, it's time to walk away from this. It's time to walk away from that. And we're in that moment of temptation and we're listening to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's pointing the way out to where then we could share with others, you know, this is really the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. The Holy Spirit was convicting me. The Holy Spirit was giving me power. I couldn't get through this. I I could not find the way out of this sin. I've tried on my own. It was a work of, of the Holy Spirit in my life. Wouldn't it be neat if somebody came to us over time and said, man, you know, I really see joy in your life. You know, I have a friend that's going through a lot of really hard times and he had someone come up next to him and go, there's no reason you should have joy in your life with what you're going through. It has to be Jesus in your life. Like that's the fruit of the spirit, right? That, that's, that's overflowing joy when the Holy Spirit meets us. Wouldn't it be neat to see God put steps of faith in our lives where we take it in obedience to the spirit going, man, I wouldn't have talked to this person. I wouldn't have reached out to this person. I wouldn't have texted this person. That was the Holy Spirit that was leading in my life. So let's not complicate it. As we enter into communion tonight, if you're like, man, I really need that fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, or I've never asked the Lord to be filled with the Spirit, come and receive prayer. Maybe it is that you come forward and receive prayer. Maybe it's you get alone with the Lord and just cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I really want to know this. I've heard this, but I want to know this. God, would you empower me? Would you fill me afresh with your spirit? So let's stand together and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of the spirit. We thank you for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And we acknowledge that it's not gonna be by power or by might. It's not gonna be by our good ideas or our strategies. But we do desire a a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit Jesus, you tell us to ask, so we ask. Would you empower us with your spirit? Holy Spirit, would you be our helper? Would you be our guide? Would you lead us in truth? Would you convict us of sin? Would you lead us into steps of faith for your glory? We thank you for this opportunity to come and enjoy the communion table. And as it is Valentine's Day, we we celebrate the love that you have given to us. And Lord, we ask as a church family that we would be baptized afresh in your Holy Spirit for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.